My name is Shub. I'm a Shulik Leader Scholar studying Biomedical Sciences and a member at STEM Fellowship. And you're listening to STEM Fellows, a monthly podcast where I have conversations with prominent STEM leaders to spark big ideas. Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of STEM Fellows. This month, I'm thrilled to have Cole Roberts on the show. Cole is a Shulik Leader Scholar entering the third year of his electrical engineering degree with a minor in energy and environmental engineering. As a student, he has continually sought opportunities to implement sustainable practices in his projects and currently serves as the president of the Energy and Environment Engineering Students' Association at the University of Calgary, as well as a director and the chief scholarship mentorship officer for the Dutless Students, a nonprofit that provides scholarship, mentorship, and financial literacy resources pro bono. Cole, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. Thanks, Shub. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm super excited to be on the STEM Fellows podcast. And, and yeah, I can't wait, to, can't wait to chat with you today. It's good to catch up. Yeah, no, we've known each other for a while now, actually, Cole. I think it's been yeah. almost two years now. And yeah. I've, I've been thinking about having you on the show for a while, like you were on my list and I'm finally glad it's uh, being done. Uh, I, I, I'm actually, I was really looking forward to this episode particularly because uh, you're just an amazing individual and you're up to so many things. So I'm uh, looking forward to discussing all that with you. So uh, you probably already know this from previous episodes, but I always like to start off the episode by just asking you about a little bit of a context, mainly about like who you are, uh, where you came from, and what's really brought you to where you are today. So would you mind just touching on those uh, a bit? Yeah, absolutely. So for a little bit of background on sort of who I am. So I'm proud to have been born and raised in Calgary, Alberta. Um, I'm still here today, and as I, I attend the University of Calgary in my hometown. So so yeah, I, I grew up in, in South Calgary my entire life, and I haven't moved too much, which has been really exciting. And Calgary is a city that I love very much and I'm very proud to call home and uh, and I've loved to see I've been really excited to see it grow over the last few years and uh, I I really hope to start my career here and 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 live a good chunk of my life here if, I, if I'm given that opportunity. Uh, I grew up um, playing baseball and hockey. Uh, I love both sports very much um, and I'm from a family of five so busy household. I'm the oldest of three children. I have a brother in his first year of university uh, and a sister in the 12th grade. So yeah, busy household. And um, and yeah, both my parents um, are in Calgary and my, my mom grew up here, dad's from BC. So pretty Canadian background, but but yeah, that's that's where I've come from. And, um, what, um, and yeah, kind of what's brought me to where I am today. Um, I, I grew up basically my entire life. Uh, I love math and science and I love to solve problems. Um, and I always was really excited and, and enjoyed that feeling of solving problems and, and just really engaging like my brain to full levels. And, you know, when you're good at math and you like to solve problems, everyone and their dog tells you to be an engineer. And you know, <laughs> I don't like to sometimes go off the beaten path, but I decided that that'd be a good path for me. And I, I spent a lot of time chatting with engineers and um, I'm really excited to where it's led me today, going into my third year of electrical engineering. And uh, it's brought me a lot, lots of opportunities so far. And, and, um, and yeah, and I've been really excited and uh, honored to have leadership opportunities such as TDS and uh, ESA. Um, and, and yeah, I just loved exploring my passions, meeting great people and, and uh, being a part of a community in all facets of my life. And, and yeah, it's, it's been nothing short of an honor and a pleasure. And I'm, t- I'm just getting started and I can't wait to see where those things go. Thank you. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, thank you for being able to share all that about you. And you didn't mention this, but you also recently won a one of Canada's most prestigious scholarships, uh, the Schulich Leader Scholarship. And I really want to discuss that with you because I think that's going to be important to some of the viewers listening, uh, mainly if maybe they'd be interested in applying for it, or maybe uh, they're looking down the road of uh, potentially applying it to uh, applying for it in the future. So I'd love to delve more into that a bit later on. But for now, maybe we can set up some context for the viewers and uh, go into a little bit about what your high school experiences have been like. So would you mind just like, I guess, guiding us through high school? Like, maybe start off with some of the extracurriculars you're involved in. And that's like, th- that's pretty much what sets you to where you are today. So uh, would be nice if you could discuss those. 
Yeah, so I was involved in a few extracurriculars throughout high school. There's not a total laundry list, but the one that first comes to mind is I was part of a, of a organization called Bob for Sight. Uh, for context, the high school that I went to is Bishop O'Byrne High School in Calgary, Alberta. Um, if you're from that school, then super excited that you're listening to this episode. And um, so the I, I was the president and leader of the Bob for Sight initiative in my last year, and it was a part of it in the 11th grade as well. And what uh, Bob for Sight does is they raise money for the international charity Operation EyeSight, which focuses on raising money to prevent um, and provide eye care um, for people in developing countries. So for example, um, there's a ton, of, uh, most blindness blindness um, in developing countries is preventable um, and it's relatively low cost and, um, and, and cheap to fix if they have access to those medical services and the funds to do so. So what Operation EyeSight does is funds those surgeries and um, things such as eye, eyewear and eyeglasses for people in those countries so that they can have the ability to see, which I, I'm sure you're aware is, is a huge factor in your ability to provide for yourself and your family and just general quality of life. So I had a ton of fun raising money through things such as bake sales, a Twitch stream, um, and other things like that for um, Bob for Sight and some of the leadership experiences and um, just the experience of, of helping people out kind of inspired me to keep doing that as I got into university. Um, okay. Along with Bob for Sight, I was also a member of Set Challenge, which is run by the University of Calgary and does like science challenges for, for students. So, so yeah, um, that's kind of the two highlights there. And uh, yeah, in school, I, I took the full IB program. I was an international baccalaureate student and, and went through all that. Um, it was a fun time. Um, and Shout out to all the IBers out there. Woot. Show, yeah. Oh my <laughs> gosh. I, I, I know you guys are going through it right now. So yeah, keep hanging there. You got this. IB challenged me a lot and made me, I think, a better student and a more resilient person. So to say what you will about it, but yeah, that's that, that's my experience. And yeah, high school is great, but I'm super excited to be where I'm at now. And I'm thankful that it led me down this path. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Cole. And I think I can say the same about IB. Definitely challenged me a lot. And uh, it's what really has brought me to where, where I am today. So grateful for that, even though it was a brutal few, few years in high school. But uh, I just wanted to quickly go back to your experiences with uh, Operation, uh, was it Bob uh, or Eyesight? Bob for Sight, yeah. But it was, Bob it was sort of a, a charity that raised money for Operation Eyesight. Kind of. Yeah, so like just based on your experiences for that, uh, I'm sure you've found like things that have worked and haven't worked in terms of uh, fundraising. So like for anybody listening, did you have any like advice or tips in that regard? Like how you can like effectively fundraise for different causes? Because I know that that was a big thing in my high school too. And I'm still trying to find the answer. So like, no worries if you don't have like the ideal answer to that. Yeah. So I think some of the, the things that I noticed after the fact when kind of reflecting is when you're raising money, you're typically, you're, you're asking people to give you money, right? Um, we did things like bake sales and Twitch streams. So there was like an incentive for them. You weren't just asking for outright donations. Mm -hmm. But something that's really important when you're doing fundraisers fundraisers is making it like super easy for the attendees of your event or the people who are buying your cookies or or whatever it may be to like donate right um for example like if someone's donating on twitch to incentivize a teacher to wear a gorilla costume real story mm -hmm. um, make it easy for them to donate on twitch make, make it easy for them to um pay with a toonie or loony at, at a bake sale um make it very accessible and even nowadays if it's possible try to make sure people can tap their card or, or pay with apple pay mm. because I mean, in this post-COVID world, I know I don't use cash a whole lot. And just making things easy for people to donate and support you is so important. Like, I, I can't how many times people in my high school, um, you know, we were, we were all like 17, 18 years old. So a lot of us had debit credit cards, but they couldn't use it and they didn't carry any change around because on the day-to-day -day basis, they had no use for it, right? And if you don't remember to bring change in the day the bake sale, then you can't really help out. So making things accessible for your attendees and the people who you're sort of targeting is super important. Um, and beyond that, just in general, uh, planning is always key to everything in your life. Plan, add con contingencies if things don't go the right way the first time. And, and yeah, um, it's a big learning experience. And I'd encourage you if you're, if you're thinking about fundraising, just dive in um, and, um, and take lessons from there. 
Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to that. Like you covered a lot of it. Like I had similar experiences, try to uh, make it more accessible. And also something to keep in mind is be aware of your audience. Like if you're trying to sell things to broke high school students or something, then maybe reconsider, like maybe stretch out to teachers as well. Cause that's actually how we got a lot of our sales in high school. Uh, we targeted like the teachers, like one fundraiser we did was like a teacher potluck. And like we raised like, two to $300 in like an hour. Whereas we raised only like $20 in like an hour if we just did like a bake sale or something to the students themselves. So yeah, consider that as well. But no, very cool. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Cole. Uh, the next thing was uh, academics. I, I know high school, a lot of students are still exploring, trying to uh, get the gears. Uh, they're they're still running. They're trying to still settle in. Like what works best for them. How they can study more effectively. So, like, did you have any tips or advice uh, for emerging high school students or maybe even university students um, on how they can excel uh, academically? Yeah. Like, first things first, and I think I'm gonna probably repeat myself like a little bit of a broken record sort of throughout this episode is I don't think there's like one sort of cookie cutter or formulaic way to be successful or, or win something or do anything. Like wh whatever you do needs to work for you and needs to be a reflection of you. Um, but I think what I found most in my personal experience and, and what I still do in university, and it's really useful given the fact that I study engineering, is I feel like I learn better by doing than by reading. And I've taken this into my engineering co-op terms. I've taken this everywhere. Um, like, yeah, reading up and studying is important, sometimes getting your hands a little dirty figuratively or, or literally if, if you're working with your hands on on something um, is the best way to learn because you learn quickly and you get that sort of instant feedback right did you get the practice problem right or did you not um, mm -hmm. are you building this thing correctly or did you not that sort of instant feedback and practicing and making your brain think of creative ways to solve problems is just like a great life skill in general beyond sort of the academic field but really helps you and in things such as like math and science, where when you're being tested on say math 30, um, for those listening, math 30 is the grade 12 level math in Alberta, or your grade 12 level sciences, it's all practice problems anyway on the exam, right? So the, the earlier you practice being in sort of that exam and testing environment, I feel like your results will be better. Um, beyond that, um, I would always encourage people to, you know, put in the work. Um, being a great student um, is not easy. Um, and putting in the work, doing practice problems, um, and, and pushing yourself to sort of meet those sort of expectations is really important. You may not always do it, and that's totally natural. So there were some times in high school where I had chemistry practice problems to do, but I was exhausted because I had a long day and not all of them got done. They weren't due for homework, but they didn't get done. And that's okay. You don't need to be perfect. You're not going to be an ideal student all the time, but push yourself to do that. And I encourage students who maybe, you know, you don't need to do all the practice problems and you're still going to do fine on the test, right? Math comes easy to you. You know, you don't need to practice to, to do well. I still encourage you to practice, you know, like push yourself to get that, that highest level of achievement and more importantly, the highest level of understanding that you can. Um, you'll, you'll only benefit from being, you know, an awesome understander of math, an awesome understander of science or, or even English or social studies. You can tell that I, I come from the STEM side of things. Um, you know, push yourself um, and find a routine that works for you as well. When are you going to study? How are you going to study? What works for you? And like, kind of experiment with that and find it. And then once you get kind of get in that groove, then I think you're then once you kind of get in that groove and that rhythm, you're good mm -hmm. to go. And you, it's a it's a really exciting thing when you find that rhythm. And I'm still working on finding that sometimes, but it definitely worked for me. I think throughout high school and into my university career so far. No, that, that's perfect, Cole. I, I really like what you said about practice problems and practice tests, because that's really what it's going to translate to on the day of. And those two things have been like the biggest game, game changer for me. Uh, in high school, I didn't like do them as much because I guess they weren't as available. But as you're entering uni for those first year students, uh, they're a huge help. Like for my OCHEM midterms and finals, they, they had exams available until like 2000. And I tried to do like all of them or as many as I could before like each midterm and final. And yeah, if I didn't do them, then I obviously would have got like, like a failed or something. But because of that, I was able to bring my grade up to like those uh, upper, upper nineties and all of that. So um, practice problems, practice tests. Yeah. Game changer. Definitely do them. Uh, would also highly recommend the audience to check out uh, Ali Abdal's work. He 
and goes into a lot about how you can like study more effectively and they're like scientific scientifically proven evidence-based uh methods and i i'm still using a lot of them and yeah that's that's been a huge game changer for me too and when i'm like having trouble finding motivation uh, I know a lot of people do, maybe they're just procrastinating or something like we're all, all victims of that. Uh, something that's really helped me is just playing like instrumental or lo-fi music in the background that you, that just usually just gets my like juices flowing and helps me get whatever done. Like I, I was doing that earlier, uh, even before, like we were recording while I was doing work. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Just to kind of touch on what you said there. Um, I, I don't know what your experience is like, Shu. Um, we're both University of Calgary students, as, um, but like if you get a prof that has those like practice problems or old exams, like it is like nothing short of a lifesaver. I can probably count on two hands now, um, two years through my degree, the amount of courses that I probably would not have done very well in it at all if I didn't have the chance to kind of see the general type of questions before I actually wrote it. Because some courses are not easy. Like they're very hard to find practice questions for organically. Um, if you're not, like, just because you're getting the subject material that's, that's much more specialized and, you know, it's not just basic anymore. So it's hard to find the right sort of area. Practice tests and practice problems are amazing. Um, and I would always encourage students to like, if your profs don't have them, you know, give them a poke, ask them for them uh, or, or ask for, former students of the class for practice problems, like do what you can to get all those resources in hand because it'll pay off. Like Shu, you mentioned to me a few times that some of your profs maybe maybe don't have that. And many of my friends in the science faculty find that to be a bit of a challenge and they have some pretty creative workarounds and, and a lot of it involves, you know, working with your peers. So super important. And I don't know if Shu's had any experiences with that, but definitely something I've kind of heard down the grapevine and something I've had to do a little bit as well. So definitely, definitely a lifesaver when it comes down to like a midterm that is not going to be the greatest regardless. Yeah. Just expanding on that quote, there have been some courses where there were no finals available, but I just sent the professor an email and like that worked, like they were able to like draft something up based on the final. So yeah, don't be, don't hesitate to reach out to like your professor or teacher if they don't have like any practice material available. Cause you'd be surprised. Um, even if they, they're like, yeah, no, we don't. So, uh, yeah, something to keep in mind. Uh, I just wanted uh, to discuss one last thing with you in terms of, like the high school spectrum goal. And that was just, uh, if you were to uh, go back and give your 18 year old self one single piece of advice, uh, maybe your grade 12 self, uh, or maybe when you're, as you're studying high school or like starting uni, what, what would that be? Um, I think the biggest piece of advice I'd give myself is just to give the, the listeners a bit of a background um, is I think I spent a lot of grade 12 super stressed out. Um, I, I was obsessed with like perfection when it came to my grades. I pushed myself really hard there. I pushed myself really hard to get into university and, and apply for scholarships and, you know, and, you know, win those scholarships, you know, like I became somewhat of, I don't want to say an obsession. That's maybe a little too harsh of a word, but I wanted it and I wanted it bad. And I think like that kind of ambition and, and that sort of like focus and, and hyper vision is a good thing in the right amount. So I think I would go back and tell my 18 year old self. And I feel like since then I've done a lot of growing. I mean, the pandemic, I think aged a lot of us like <laughs> many more years, but I think I just tell myself to, uh, I always say these words and that actually comes from the NBA and the Philadelphia 76ers who I'm a Raptors fan, so I'm not, don't know Canadians. I Please do not judge me for this, but I always say trust the process. Um, <laughs> and I tell myself to trust the process and, you know, know that hard work nearly always will get you in a better place than where you are right, right now. I, I would tell myself to cool down a little bit. I was always super stressed and, and high strung. And, and I would just tell myself to, to calm down, keep working hard and, you know, keep striving towards your goals because you're going to have to do that, honestly, the rest of your life. But enjoy enjoy your high school experience you know it's pre-march 13th 2020 so it, the world is still normal and um and just take it easy trust the process don't stress out so much like everything will be okay and um i'd encourage people who are listening to this maybe in, in grade 12 or or if you're in a or high school or even university and and you know you're stressed out you don't know what things are going to look like you know think back to where you were three years ago and you'll and you, you'll probably be pretty proud of yourself because you're gonna be like wow I worked so hard these last three years and yeah, I got myself into a new spot and, and, you know, maybe those, maybe those changes aren't super noticeable yet, but you know, growth is a really important thing. And, uh, but don't stress yourself out doing it, you know, 
life's more than just moving forward. You got to enjoy where you are in the moment, this moment as well. So yeah, that's my advice. It's long winded, but yeah. I really like that call and I, I can relate to, to that as well. Um, I've always told myself uh, after uh, hearing these wise, wise words to enjoy the journey and not the destination. Uh, and I think that goes along with your message uh, perfectly. So trust the process and uh, enjoy the journey, not the destination. Cool. Absolutely. So uh, we're still in high school. You you talked about this a little bit, but you won the Schulich Leader Scholarship, which is Canada's most coveted undergraduate STEM scholarship. And you received it to study engineering at the University of Calgary. So this is something I really want to discuss with you because not everybody has the opportunity to, uh, I guess, win, win such a big award like this. So I wanted to share the process with everybody, like how it works, uh, how did you go about applying to it, uh, what were the fields after you won it. So maybe we can just take it from the top and cover all of that. Uh, let's start off with very start. You're, you're still a high school student. You're maybe transitioning into grade 12. Uh, can you guide me through the application process? Like how you went about writing it? Did you get help from others? Like just, yeah. Yeah. So to kind of give you like context and where I, where I heard about it is grade 11, you know, I started thinking about, you know, university is not too far away. Um, I started looking at programs I was interested in. And of course, with that scholarships, you know, I was, I wanted to, you know, support myself as best as I could financially and, and uh, scholarships are, are an amazing way to do that. Um, so in grade 11, I first read about the Schulich Leader Scholarship and um, I talked about how is Canada's like most coveted um, and often referred to as one of the most prestigious awards in Canada um, for STEM students. And I was at that point a, an aspiring STEM student um, in a university and I thought the scholarship would be a good fit for me. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of, I, when I did my research, I was, you know, on different university sites and I kind of just made a bookmark in my mind of, you know, I, I want this and, you know, it's something I should apply for, you know? Um, so I, the process for Schulich Leader Scholarships to, to win it was you need to get nominated by your high school. And, um, uh, the criteria has changed a little bit, but not so much that anything I'm going to say is incorrect. And I checked the criteria before this. So one high school and uh, one student per high school can nominate one, one student for the Schulich Leader Scholarship. Um, and if you're in Quebec, if you're a Quebecois student listen to this, if you're in a stage, yep, they can nominate two people for the Schulich Leader Scholarship. Um, and the way that you get nominated by your school varies by the school. Like there's no like set formal process to the best of my knowledge, or at least in my school. Um, how you got nominated to we won the same scholarship, um, which pro was probably much different than I did. I essentially just wrote a draft of my final application and gave it to my school. And they picked from the pool of our, our potential applicants and our potential nominees. And I was, mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough and, and I was honored to be selected. Um, and from there, then you actually apply on the Schulich Leader like web portal as a nominee for your high school. Um, and that application consists of like an essay explaining why you'd make a great Schulich leader, talking about your greatest achievements um, in the extenuating circumstances, um, and, and questions such as that you'll see other way, um, elsewhere in your scholarship application, such as where do you see yourself in 10 years? And something that if you've ever been in a job interview, you've definitely heard as well. So you, you answer those questions and then those go to uh, the pool. And based on the universities you apply to, um, the universities you apply to will have access to your application. So for me, I applied to two universities being the University of Alberta and the UFC. Um, and they have access to your Schulich, Schulich Leader um, application. And then the universities pick a selected number of Schulich Leaders each year, uh, half for science and half for engineering. Um, and um, how the universities select, we're not totally sure. Like there's no sort of public process for it, but they pick you. Um, there's no interviews like that, or at least in my experience, there was no interviews. Um, and, but you get selected uh, once your application is sent to them by like the Schulich Leader Scholarships um, people. Um, and yeah, you get selected and they, they, they reach out to you and they let you know you won. And I was fortunate enough that on April 3rd, 2020, I got that call. Um, and to be honest with you, like it was like it has been and is continues to be nothing short of life changing and it can continues to be the, the greatest honor and, and fortunate thing that's ever that's ever happened in my life. And I'm still so, so honored to be a Schulich leader and it has changed my life, um, not only supporting my degree like financially, 
but giving me opportunities to interact with other shoe lift leaders, such as yourself, Shu, which is, which is how we met. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's kind of like the rundown of, of how, how I got it and, and, and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but yeah, so it's a pretty, it's a unique process compared, compared to other scholarships, but um, um, it was a good ride nonetheless. Yeah, it was a really similar process for me as well, minus the uh, initial like submitting your application to the high school. So they nominate you. For us, it was just submitting like a one page document, like full of like our uh, grades throughout like nine through 12 or nine through 11 and just different things we've done in terms of like leadership and all of that. So uh, it depends, it's, it's by school, but uh, yeah, you can uh, coordinate that way. But thank you for being able, being able to share, share that call. Uh, the next thing I just wanted to get into was now that people are familiar with the application process and now they're interested in applying uh, and they're starting to maybe look at the application, but they're not sure how to approach it. So did you have any like tips or words of wisdom for these senior high school students who may be nominated by their school and wanting to apply for the Schulich or even any other major scholarship, because you are the director of a, a scholarship consulting firm that helps students apply to scholarships. So uh, like any tips in that regards, and I can pitch in as well uh, based on whatever you say. Yeah, absolutely. Shub. I appreciate you pitching in as well. Cause um, I think you, you'll, you'll, you'll echo this. Um, so when you apply to a scholarship, like I said this prior, and you're, you're going to hear me say it again, so I don't say I didn't warn you, is there's no like cookie cutter or formulaic way to apply for a scholarship. Um, how you write like a scholarship essay or and prompts in like a smaller, more to short paragraph time, um, form will vary between applicants and the people who win the scholarship may not answer or approach these things at all the same. And that's okay. I always say like you want these applications um, and apologies for any background noise there. You want these applications to reflect you as a person and, and be, yeah, and reflect you, like who you truly are the best way possible. That is how you stick out to these nomination um, committees or interviewers or whatever, is be you and, and show them who you really are. And I think that's the way you write the best applications anyways. It's hard to write formulaically and, and try to be or write no. in a way that's not reflecting of you, right? So be who you are. And, and I mean, it goes without saying, always address the prompt exactly, like be very literal about it. Why, mm -hmm. you'd, make a, why you'd make a great Shulik leader? Here's why I'd make a great Shulik leader. You know, like be very literal with it. Um, maybe in more nuanced words, but make sure you like address the prompt. Like don't, don't go off the, the beaten trail. Um, yeah. And reflect your experiences. Reflect on how you've grown as a person in high school, because that's what I did. You know, what impacted me? Like, how did Bob Versailles impact me as a leader? Um, how did how did being, you know, who I am today, how much of that was reflected with my experiences? So make things personal to you. Um, multiple drafts are so important. Get that peer edited by everyone mm -hmm. and anyone. Peer edits are so important. Shub will tell you that. I know Shub could probably go into more detail. I, I think I had my essay That's edited my by at least seven, at least seven people. Me probably more uh, like my teachers, m like some of my closest friends who I know I could trust, like other friends, people I knew who were good at English, uh, major scholarship recipients. I just reached out to people on LinkedIn. Like you'd be surprised how much that helps you. And going back to your point about uh, like conveying who you are, Cole, probably the, like, the best piece of advice I've ever received in terms of writing uh, it doesn't even just have to be restricted to scholarship writing is to tell your story. And this could go with like public speaking, whatever you do in work, telling your story is so important. And that's, what's going to differentiate you from the other thousands of people who are also going to be applying to the same scholarship or uh, like maybe same work position or whatever. And what I mean by this is what people usually do is they kind of just like go to their resume and like kind of just regurgitate what's on there, maybe like describe it in more detail. But instead, what you should do is you should try to find a way to tie everything together that's in your resume. Maybe you were a part of this volunteering organization and then you did this leadership activity. Try to find like commonalities or themes between these different activities and try to tell it in like one cohesive story. And that's really what's going to make you stand out from everybody else. Because uh, 
people always ask like, how, how can I be different from all of these other people applying? Well, that's, that's the secret way. And that's, I think what got me to winning all of the different scholarships uh, and awards I've received over the past several years doing just that. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you had anything to add to that Cole, but uh, I think that's always really important and be concise. Like if you can tell something in two words instead of five, like use do two words instead of five. Uh, the, I I'd highly recommend checking out a book called uh, The Elements of Style by um, Strunk Jr. White. So I'll put the book in the show notes, but that's a really good book in terms of uh, like how to write better in terms of style and grammar. So that, that was a huge game changer for me too. But yeah, that, that's my yeah, biggest piece of, piece of advice I can share with everybody. No, that's really great. And I really like that note about like, tell your story. Like that's so important. And it's, it's such a great thing to think about whenever you're speaking in front of like large groups of people or writing to mm-hmm. committees or whatever it may be. And it's something to take throughout your career in life, not just applications. Um, and yeah, I just like to want to emphasize the fact like me and Shu, yeah, we have some commonalities in what brought us to winning that scholarship and what brought us to here today. But we had super unique paths. We, we wrote super uniquely for our applications. We read each other's applications. Um, and we did things differently to get where we are. So like, you don't, don't think that there's only one right way to do things, because um, there never is. And that, that, that same observation, I found is, has like even carried through like to my work experience or experience in clubs. Like we, me and Shub are, are so different but we both found a lot of satisfaction and happiness and also challenges and struggles in our own different way. And, and that's, it helped us win Schulich. Um, but it doesn't mean that you have to do the exact same thing. So don't, don't let yourself feel that you're not worthy or not able to win that scholarship. Cause I, I sort of felt that way. Um, but mm-hmm. I, I still feel that way sometimes because it, it also has a lot to do with luck. So like, do not be harder on yourself uh, if you don't end up winning like one of the major scholarships, because like, I was just hoping for the best. I know the chances were really slim and it worked in my, my favor and odds. And you'll hear that from many other recipients as well. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So uh, Cole, this, you, you mentioned this earlier, but like this award has definitely impacted my life in unimaginable ways. And you said the same for yourself and it's provided me with opportunities. I never knew I would have had, and I'll be forever, forever grateful for them. But in that regard, I just wanted to ask you if you'd mind uh, expanding on some of these opportunities a little bit more, like uh, how, how has this award helped you other than just like giving you that money or financial aid to fund your studies? Yeah. So yeah, the money is, is, is important and, and money makes the world go around. Um, so I can't overstate that that's been a blessing and I'm super excited for it, but something that has been amazing about being a Shulik leader and is the biggest reason of why I'm sitting here talking to Shu Patel today on the staff <laughs> podcast um, is the Shulik leader scholarship opens you up to be a member of like the Shulik leader, leader network. Um, and that network is comp- comprised of, of hundreds of the scholarship winners um, all the way back to when the scholarship first started, which I believe was 2011 or 2012. Um, and some of those people um, are, are doing amazing things within their universities or if they're to graduation. So many of them have gone on to, to show their entrepreneurial spirit, which is one of the award categories. Um, and it, they're just a great people to, to interact with and talk with, learn about their experiences and, and their life lessons. Um, and, um, and yeah, it just is, it's, it's an amazing opportunity to, to hear from people across Canada, which are, with a wide variety of experiences, um, who've been very successful in different facets of their life. And, and your network is, is, is everything I think as like a young student and as a, as a young aspiring professional. So that network has been amazing. Um, we have a yearly event called SLXCA and then smaller mm-hmm. regional events that are based on the provinces. And those um, have been amazing as well. We've heard from speakers who are, were experts on things such as AI, like the godfather of AI. Um, we've had speakers from various startups, such as, um, uh, I believe it's called Study Board, which was Canada's second unicorn company ever. Um, and just hearing from those people and getting those events has been amazing. And at the very least, it puts you in contact with people who 
may have some common interests and um, a common ambition of yours. And uh, that's how Shub and I met um, when in April, uh, as we were wrapping up our high school and in the middle of a pandemic, um, how I came to be to join TDS, which um, Shub founded, and we're going to touch on later for sure. So yeah, it has been awesome. That network and those opportunities to just hear people and talk to people mm -hmm. has have been incredible. And I cannot overstate how amazing that is. And how important networking has been in my career, um, mm -hmm. both as a Shulik leader and just as somebody who's trying to go in there and get a job, you know? So, so yeah, I don't know, Shub, what did you, what have you found to kind of be yeah. the biggest part of your life with being a Shulik so leader? So yeah, that's one of the biggest things, like obviously meeting, being able to meet you and many of the other extraordinary leaders. Uh, another thing is just it being so much easier to navigate university and as well as work because Shulik really helps you out with that. Like, especially if you're an engineering student or like in that like STEM, like heavy natural science STEM field, uh, they have so many different internship opportunities where what they can do is they can just like flag your application or something. So let's say you're applying to Google or uh, IBM. Like those are some of the bigger companies that you're able to apply to. Uh, they can, yeah, just flag your application and you'll be at a better chance of, I guess, getting a job with them than uh, like the standard applic applicant. So that's been huge help for, uh, I, I've heard that's been a huge help for others, but in my experience, I'm not like in engineering or that kind of field. I'm uh, more, I've dedicated more of my time towards doing research over the summers. And it's also helped me so much in that regard too. Like when I was first started reaching out to professors to find like a summer research position at the coming school of medicine, a like I've heard that professors don't even reply to like first year students. Like they just go through or they're like, yeah, sorry, we don't have any positions. I reached out to at least eight or nine professors and almost everybody like got back to me. And most of them offered me like a video call, like meet or something. And I think that was just because I was like, I, I wrote that I won the Shulik Leader Scholarship. So after they saw that, um, they were like more inclined to like have me uh, work in their lab. So that's been a huge help as well. And just being able to meet the university ad administration as well. Like Cole and I were like, Cole, I and all of the other Shulik Leader Scholars at the UFC were able to meet with their president. Uh, as well as the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Dean of the Faculty of Engineering. And just having those connections is so nice because like they're able to guide you, mentor you, and uh, I guess just push you in the right direction so you can make the most out of your time at university. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And yeah, things like that are such a leg up and just having that sort of like trade about you and it doesn't have to be a scholarship for people who are thinking like oh i maybe i don't have this on my resume like mm -hmm. having that sort of leverage or even that connection with somebody when you're trying to you know get yourself an opportunity or get yourself in the door is so important um and yeah you talking to your university admin and, and faculty is is amazing like i having to talk to the chance to talk to the president of the university of calgary a couple times um and hear his story um and the dean of the shuley school of engineering and and hear hear his story Obviously, those are people who have been tremendously successful and are tremendously wise within their fields. And somebody who parts of their life you may want to emulate or or try to do similar things to. So just having the chance to do that is is so important. And I'd always encourage you to, you know, get yourself out there. Talk to people who are, mm -hmm. you know, high up in their company, high up in the university, or somewhere that someone that you want to be like one day, you know the worst you can do when you send these a cold message or a cold email is you don't get anything back or you get a no. If you don't try, the answer is always no. Always a no. So I, I love that advice, Cole, because like yeah. if I hadn't sent those cold messages out, like I wouldn't be here. Like I wouldn't have won the shoe like scholarship because yeah, that was one of the biggest factors. Like I reached out to uh, the other co-founder of TDS. Well, we'll get into what TDS is in a bit. But like, if I hadn't sent that cold message on LinkedIn just to reach out to say hi, like he'd been a previous friend, but uh, I, I saw that he'd won the TD scholarship two years before. So I thought he would be able to like guide me in the right direction when I started applying to scholarships. And if I hadn't reached out to him on LinkedIn, like I, I know for sure I wouldn't have won uh, one of the major scholarships and I wouldn't be here. So yeah, don't don't be afraid because the worst thing that can happen is just they don't they leave you on red or you just, they just, you just get a no for an answer. Absolutely. Stuff. Um, yeah. We've been talking about this for quite a bit now, Cole, but what is TDS? Like, let, let us talk about it. Um, did, did you want to introduce TDS? Or? Shub, um, I, I'm definitely happy to provide some details on what I do. 
But okay. something I think that people would be super interested in hearing is what's the origin story of TBS? I came in kind oh. of early, but I was not a founder. So Shiva, <laughs> I'd love for you to explain more about how you met the co-founder of TBS and, and how it came to be. Yeah, it would be an honor, Cole. Thank you for asking. Maybe you we can switch roles here. You can do my interview and then we can, uh, I, I can, <laughs> uh, just switching, switching seats right now. But uh, my journey with TDS first started when I was still a senior in high school. Applying to scholarships was really important for me at that time because the only way I could have pursued post-secondary studies outside of the city I was living in at that time, it was just a small city in Northern Alberta. It's called Grand Prairie. Uh, if any of you are listening from there, shout out to Grand Prairie. But the only way I could have attended uh, university outside of that city, and it was just a college there, by the way, at that time. So I, I know I wanted to expand my doors and have more opportunities. And yeah, so the only way I could have moved out was if I had a scholarship fund my education just because of my personal circumstances at that time. So uh, I was very eager. I made this entire list of scholarships I was going to apply to. I embarked on my journey. And as I was looking through uh, the different resources that are available to high school students to apply, I came across these organizations called, uh, not called, but like just for-profit organizations that uh, we're helping students apply to scholarships at a charge. So I, I didn't know what the charge was and I found it enticing. So I signed up on their website, their services. And I'm like, okay, this, this would be cool. Like it's a gold mine. I'll be able to improve my chances of winning one of these. So I sign up. And when I have the initial meet with them at the end of the meet, they tell me that they are going to charge me anywhere from hundreds to thousands of dollars just to apply to a few scholarships. And I was just shocked by that number because I already didn't have the funds to, I guess, fund my post-secondary. Um, how was I going to find the funds to pay these people? And my chances of winning like a scholarship through them wasn't even guaranteed. So who knows if I was just be giving money to them and not getting anything out of it. So I obviously didn't go through with them. Uh, instead, I looked towards other resources like my mentors, friends, LinkedIn, cold LinkedIn messages. And through their help, I was very fortunate enough to receive the Schulich Leader Scholarship on April 3rd, 2020, as uh, same as you, Cole. And I'm just very grateful for that. So after I received that scholarship, a uh, person who'd been mentoring me very closely, his name is Ken Johnson, uh, shout out to Ken. He was a TD Community Leader scholar, uh, scholar from uh, 2018. And he, he just called me uh, and he told me about this idea he's had for a while about starting this company. Uh, that would help students apply to scholarships. But at that time, he was thinking that he would try to charge people some money. But after we talked through it a bit and found out about those for-profit companies that were already charging students, we decided that if we were to start this organization, we wanted to do our services completely pro bono and free of charge to students. So that's essentially how TDS came about. Like uh, We talked about it in April, and then we got incorporated federally through the government in uh, May of 2020, I believe. And since then, we've been providing, oh, uh, since then, we've recruited so many outstanding individuals, uh, major scholarship recipients and student leaders all over Canada, with Cole being uh, one of the many incredible people on our team. Uh, he's actually a director now, so he's running the organization. But uh, it's just been outstanding. And what we do is we just provide scholarship, uh, financial literacy, and essay editing services to students uh, completely free of charge. And it's been pretty remarkable because over the past two, three years we've been in service, uh, we've impacted thousands of students around the world. Uh, and the 80 or 90 students we've directly mentored have gone on to winning more than two or $3 million in scholarships. I'll have to get check the exact number, but uh, it's just outstanding um, that we're able to do that and make that sort of impact uh, on students' lives. But yeah, that is that yeah. is TDS. So what is TDS is covered? Now I want to go back to you, Cole. Like, what is your role? What do you do in TDS? Yeah. So she mentioned um, I am the chief scholarship mentorship officer and also a director of the Dallas students. So in my role as the chief scholarship mentorship officer, I'm going to say CSMO, um, CSMO, just to shorten it. You know, um, I lead the scholarship mentorship team. So. Um, as a part of TDS, we're the team that interacts directly with students um, and, and, and um, 
helps them and guides them and, and mentors them through their application processes. Um, and we help them with scholarships, um, as she mentioned before, but we've done and we've helped out students with many other applications, whether it be um, university applications, job applications, um, just things like that, um, things within that realm, grants, what you name it. Um, we've helped students with it. And um, so what the role of a mentor is and the, the team that I lead um, is a mentor helps students um, sort of through the application processes, explains to them and um, gives them um, advice or just uh, imparts some wisdom on them from their experience. Um, our team's comprised of people who have experiences, experiences applying to these scholarships, many of them winning the scholarships and of course applying to university. And we have team members from across Canada, um, both French and English speakers um, who can just provide that and just kind of shed some light on some things like um, and we, we help them with their applications. We, we uh, provide essay edits uh, before the final edit, which is done by our essay editing team, which is uh, comprised of an awesome group of individuals who, who do amazing work and are incredible writers. Um, we provide sort of that first edit and, and help students sort of refine their essays. Um, make sure you're addressing the prompt. Um, make sure you're expanding on ideas and just making sure like your idea and the is getting across fully and it's not sort of um, hidden or marred by anything you're saying. Um, so yeah, it's just awesome to sort of walk the students from A to Z through that process and, and watch them take initiative and do it for themselves. It's really exciting just to see a student just, just knock an application out of the park. Um, and you're like, and it's, it's amazing. And, and it's been just so humbling just to see students just win these scholarships. Um, we had a couple of Schulich leaders, um, people win the Loran scholarship and it's been, it's just been amazing. And, um, just that sort of mentorship and that that one on one relationship um, is so impactful and important and 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 being a mentor and and being a mentee, um, especially as you're like a young professional, um, is is awesome. So being the leader of that team and helping pair people together and and making sure the ship runs in the background it has been an honor. And um, I'm I'm really lucky to have a, a team um, that just does incredible work. They work really hard and and they. And make sure that I think every student gets as much as and more than they that they put into TDS, and it's super exciting. So, if anyone from my, the team gets to hear this, just a huge shout out. You guys have been a pleasure to work for, and and, and make my life as the, the CSMO super easy. So, yeah, TDS is, is has been awesome, and and it pays a lot of dividends just just being a part of it and, and seeing students dreams dreams come through dreams come true. Okay, so Cole, if I'm a high school or university student, and I am very interested in signing up for TDS, how can I go about doing so? Yeah, so the easiest way to do that is navigate to the debtlessstudents.org. So the debtless, D-E-B-T-L-E-S-S, students.org. Um, there's three S's there, so make sure you write that. Um, and then hit our sign up form on our website. We have an awesome web development team that's that's done that, made that from scratch. And um, written that from the from the programming upwards. So if you're if you're a tech person and enjoy that like me, I think that's super neat. And fill out an application and um, and yeah, we'll review your application and, and get back to you and and set you up on our on our communication services and all the sort of our administrative stuff. And um, you'll be paired with a mentor. Um, another service that we'll probably look at offering in the future, depending on our demand for this year, is we're thinking about doing um, and are going to be doing scholarship office hours. So if you're a university student. Um, uh, if you're not a university student, I, I, office hours are often the time where a professor makes themselves available for questions about course content and, you know, just help students uh, walk through materials and often there'll be other people there as well. And we're going to do something similar as well, um, where we're going to have people available just to answer your questions and, and help you through applications. Like if you just have a, a quick question about, hey, how should I do this? That's what we're going to be there for and, and help you do the best that you can. And uh, and also you'll be also able to be a part of our mentorship services and be assigned a mentor. Um, so yeah, I'd encourage you to navigate to the debtlessstudents.org and sign up and um, hopefully you'll hear from I'll include that students. in the show notes, everybody. So uh, just one click of a button, you'll be able to go there. So yeah, I uh, know it was a pleasure talking about TDS with you, Cole. I'm always very excited to uh, talk about that, like a self plug there, but uh, maybe we can, I guess, shift gears a bit. Let's go to uni. Like, how, how, how is uni? Like, maybe we can start off at the start. So, transitioning from high school to uni, it was 
very brutal for me. Like I did not, like people always tell you, right? Like you need, make sure you're ready. Like make sure it's going to be really, really, like really difficult. The course like work is going to be like off the charts. And I did IB too. So like, I, like I thought I'd be kind of sort of ready for it, but like, it still hit me like a brick when I first started. And it took a bit of time. Like it took a few months to get used to like staying up like one, 2 AM sometimes trying to get work done. So like, what was it like for you? Yeah. So I think the transition, regardless of how prepared you are and regardless of how, you know, put together your study habits are, it's a tough transition. University and high school are different ball games. Like you're not in class from eight or 9 AM to three every day. Like you kind of have classes spread throughout the day and you don't really cl- do classwork in your like lectures or tutorials, which is kind of unique. Like it's all done outside. So like the whole workflow and everything's different and that in and of itself is a huge transition, but the workload in university, and I would say most notably the difficulty of the subject matter, um, I would say increases quite significantly. Um, you're really getting to, especially as you get into upper years, like uh, I always like to say that the nitty gritty of your materials and it can get really complicated and, and really challenging. It's not really something that anymore you can just kind of look at and understand. You really have to apply yourself. And that transition was something I noticed right away. Like um, I had a couple of challenging courses um, my first semester, uh, notably one that was a chemical engineering sort of intro course. Yeah. Holy, that was hard. And if you're a chemical en- engineer or a chemical engineering student listen, listening to this, um, just know that you have my my utmost respect for w- whatever the heck fluid dynamics is. Because um, it is hard and that transition is difficult. Um, but it's something that like on the positive side, I, I like university probably more than I ever liked high school. Mm. Um, I just love the opportunity to like get involved in clubs and, and expand myself technically, like with engineering clubs or, or professionally, or just make friends who have similar interests to me in clubs or also like, I love what I study. Like it's stressful sometimes, sometimes I'm, I'm stressed and I'm done and I don't want to do school anymore, just like the rest of us. But I like what I study and it's exciting to d- deep dive into something that you're excited about. And I'm Shub, I know that you, you love biomedical sciences. You dedicate your summers to researching it. So <laughs> you could probably, you could probably echo that. But yeah, that first year transition, is, it's tough. But if you work hard, get yourself into a rhythm um, of work habits and and also take time for yourself as well. Like like they, I'm, I was online, so I was sitting at this very spot for many hours every day just doing schoolwork. Um, but make sure that you don't just do school, especially when you're starting university, like do other things like run around, like do a sport club, like prioritize yeah. your mental and physical health as well. Cause it will translate to your academics. Try to change yeah. things up a bit. Yeah. Don't just study all day because you'll go crazy if you do that. And uh, yeah. one thing that's really helped me is like make friends. Cause if I didn't yeah. have like the friends I did during first year, I would not have got, gotten through first year. Like I'd, I'd be doing terrible in my courses. I'd be depressed. Uh, but it was really them who got me through and are still getting me through. So um, try to find your group of people uh, who you can relate to and yeah, keep them close. That's yeah Absolutely. one of the biggest things on my end. And Cole, I was, also wanted to ask you uh, about the clubs that you were talking about. How can incoming students like seek these different opportunities? Uh, like at Calgary, there's a central portal. They can just look at all the different student clubs, but like in general, did you have any advice for them in that regard? Um. I would say like that central portals, portal is a great jumping off point. If you're mm-hmm. a pr- prospective or current U Calgary student, it's called Club Hub. That's where you can find sort of a directory of all the clubs on campus that are registered with your student union. Mm-hmm. Um, I would I would imagine that every other university has something similar or it might be built into their website. So yeah, it should just be a few clicks away. And, and if you can't find it, then reach out to somebody. Yeah. Um, and I would encourage you if you're like looking or, or trying to find clubs, like think about what interests you. Like, what are you excited about? Like, if you love to run, um, that there's a there's a running club at the UC campus that um, I know a lot of people have a ton of fun running at. Um, if you like love sports, there's there's clubs for that that do recreational sports. Um, if you're part of a, a cultural organization, there's tons of super exciting and, and fun cultural organizations on campus that um, I know for a fact have a ton of fun. 
um, and they eat a lot of really good food as well. So <laughs> I would encourage you to, to think about what you're interested in, what you're excited about and, and join that. Like clubs should supplement your university experience more than they like add to your workload, which they do. Mm -hmm. Like you have to do things to be a part of a club, but yeah, like just, I would say start at the like, directory, start with Google, start with like online forums, such as like r slash like new Calgary or whatever. And it will help. I promise. Um, and I if there isn't interested. a club on that directory, start it yourself. Like you can, you can do that as well. So that's always an opportunity. Yeah. Absolutely. Shu, what did you kind of do for your first semester when, when you were struggling with that transition, you were putting in those long hours of one, 2 AM. How did you get through that? Cause you've obviously come out on the other side and you, you've come out with somebody who has two summers of research, research mm -hmm. experience, somebody who's super involved in a lot of different things. So how did you sort of get past that? And what would you, what, what sort of, yeah, cool. I, I, I touched on this when I said like make friends. What I used yes. to do was with one of my like closest friends who I actually made over a Zoom call. Like I just, I'm like in the chat, are there any other biochemistry kids here? And he just like replies to me. We connect on Instagram and we just started talking. Like we had a lot of similarities. He's, he's also from India. So we were able to also relate in that aspect. And we literally just hopped onto like a Zoom call every night and just did work together. So that kind of like kept us both accountable and yeah, that's, that's what got me through first and second year now as well. Yeah. yeah. That, and just like, I, like not like being resilient and not giving up, even when it gets really hard. Like if you, if you get a mark, you're not really happy about, uh, just try, try your best to like keep improving. And if it doesn't, then know you tried your hardest and there's really not much more you can do about that. And sometimes you just have to yeah give up those one-offs. Like it happens to everybody. Exactly. And yeah, just to like echo what Shub said, I was on Zoom calls doing practice problems for a few of my classes, but especially that chemical engineering class. Mm -hmm. um, and it helps. It keeps you accountable. And it's just nice to like, if you are stuck on a question, you have no idea what to do. It's nice to have somebody else to work through it because mm -hmm. two brains are better than one in, in almost every circumstance. So I would encourage you like Zoom is still a thing. Zoom with your friends if you're at home or on res or wherever you are, or if meet up, meet up with them in the library, like studying groups um the world is a collaborative place it's very rare that you work alone anyways so collaborate when you can because you can't do it in the exam room and you can't do it on certain assignments so collab when you study it's awesome it's how you make friends and it makes hard days slightly less hard when you get to meet <laughs> up with your buddies and study physics in in your library it, it it makes a difference and i promise you if you are maybe somebody who's looking to come out of their shell you will find somebody and you'll find a group that you will connect with and vibe with and um yeah. and clubs like, really help with that like if you're struggling clubs, yes, to find yes. friends then the people in your club are going to obviously have the same interests as you like at least like one thing that's common like you both enjoy doing that one thing so yeah that's obviously going to help so yeah. yeah and to touch on what you said you like like there's like when it comes to like getting grades and like to be honest with you you are i will you're pretty likely to probably get a grade that's lower than what you're very much used to in high school. Like if you're someone in high school who's done pretty well, like you've achieved and you've academically done really well for yourself throughout your entire life, university is harder and you're going to get a grade and you're probably, you might even fail something or just do quite poorly on something and that's going to happen. And that's okay. Um, you know, the road to success is, is not just a straight path. It's full of like ups and downs and valleys and mountains and, it's okay to do poorly on a quiz or a test or a midterm. It's never going to be the end of the world. And sometimes you have to temper your ex expectations to, to match the difficulty of the course material. Like I vividly remember, like on one, I, I'm talking about the same class and uh, <laughs> if you're an engineering student at UFC or you're going to be an engineering student at UFC, I'm talking about Eng 201. I'm sometimes lovingly referred to as Eng 201. Um, you'll see how much fun it is when you take it. But I, I didn't do too well in like one of our quizzes. And uh, I remember like, I was upset. Like I was just disappointed in myself and it was something I had prepared for. It wasn't a lack of preparedness, but just didn't go my way. The balance didn't go my way, but I learned from that. And I, I, I worked a little harder, put in some extra time and made sure I was in a good headspace for the next quiz. And it went better. And that's important. And Shu probably had a very similar um start to his university career and mm -hmm. probably but navigating those it was bumps uh, ochem labs for me cool uh ochem oh, labs no. no not ochem chemistry labs in first year because of covid they were worth like 60 percent of my grade and like i just did horrendous on the first one and that like frightened me because they they drop your worst one and 
like if I screwed up another one, then like it'd be over for me. So um, yeah, there's always a class like that for everybody. Exactly. But you, th- what's more important is not how, if you fall down, it's how you get up. It's kind of what I, that's one of the mottos I live by. So that's, and that's okay. And it's, it's always, you're always going to come out the other side, a stronger student and a better future engineer, a better future <laughs> doctor, whatever your goal or path is, it will, you'll be better because of it. No, I love it. Yeah. Uh, I think we discussed a fair bit about university. Uh, yeah. Just wrapping that topic off, did you have like any overall tips for like incoming engineering students or uh, just any student in general for who's, who might be entering uni or going about their life? But I think we covered a fair chunk. And I think we covered a fair chunk. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to summarize, talk to people, make friends, get yourself out there join a club. And if, if you're like a third year or fourth year student now or second year, you can still join a club. You don't just have to join in first year. Please join. Uh, I'm the president of a, a student club that I joined in second year because that's when I got into my engineering minor. Um, but yeah, like get out there, um, work hard. You're going to have to find a rhythm that works for you and um, enjoy it. University is hard, but it's something I enjoy. And it's, it's a really special experience to be on campus with your peers. And sometimes just just mud nits, like getting through the toughest part. It's it's tough and it's gonna challenge you and push you in ways you probably have never been challenged before, but it's worth it. And and um and yeah, like I, th- I think don't be too nervous, don't stress out. You are capable and you can do it. And that's something I would tell my my younger university self on my first day of school. I was mm-hmm. so anxious and so stressed. And I remember like I like could not eat or sleep and oh, it no all way. worked out okay. And I'm starting my third year in a few days here and I'm telling myself the same thing. So, so yeah, shoot, I don't know. What, what would your, what would your sort of um, advice be to someone going to university or even to, you know, first year Shub? Me friends, <laughs> like just going back to that point again, like if I didn't have that support network and uh, like even like my family at home, that was always like, that was nice because my first year was all online. So uh, very helpful having that supportive network. And just keep an open mind. Uh, office hours are a huge thing. Try your best to connect with your professors. I, since everything was online for me, I went to every single office hour for all, like every single one of my classes. And through that, like all of my professors in first year knew like my first name, like they just be like, hi, Shub or like whatever. And like, that was just really nice having that. And uh, it's just, important building that connection. So maybe if something happens in the class or maybe you're willing to, you're wanting to like discuss a grade with them, like they'd be more willing to, or if you're wanting to ask for help, they'd be more willing to uh, provide that help. Uh, so th- I, I think that's a really big advice that um, got me through first year too. make, make use of those resources. Yeah. yeah. Your professors uh, are there to help. I promise. Like they, <laughs> Uh, many of them um, they're not out to get you most of them aren't out to get you and use uh read my prof like that's a lifesaver uh yeah use read my prof but uh just transitioning gears again cole uh let's get into a little bit about like work and like internships and co-ops mainly for engineering students because i know uh they're more readily available to you guys uh for people who might be interested in pursuing one of these like in their uh, degree, like I know most engineer students do like a co-op, like how is it like finding oppor- these opportunities and how would you go like uh, recommend students go about doing that? Yeah, this, so there's, it's definitely um, a really important part of any engineering degree. Um, when you want to go out there and, and, and become an, an EIT and that's an engineer in training, that's sort of the designation you get after you get an engineering degree and you go into industry or, or wherever you end up, that's sort of like your first step into becoming a professional engineer. Um, work experience is an, a huge asset to kind of get you there. Um, engineering academia and engineering industry, there's a not, there's a bit of a disconnect there. And I think that's something, an opinion that's not my own, but it's been sort of echoed to me by many people. So um, I, um, some people may feel differently, but that's something that has been told to me by many of my coworkers and, and other people. Um, so co-op and internship, if there's an opportunity to do it at your university, I would say, you know, evaluate your personal circumstances, but it's absolutely something I would recommend and is super useful and supplement your education in an awesome way. And it's also great to make money. 
um, right? Money makes the world go round. I can say <laughs> that again. Um, so just to kind of give a background to students who may not be super aware of how um, co-op or internship programs work. Um, sorry about that. So at my university, we have an internship program and how that works is you have 12 to 16 concurrent months after your third year of st studies to work. Um, and you have to fill at least 12 of those months to sort of qualify as an internship student. Um, how you fill those 12 months is up to you. You can do one 16 month placement, which is offered, or you can do a bunch of little four month placements to string them together, excuse me. Or you can do um, like eight and eight or however you try to, try to do it. That's kind of how you get your work experience to supplement your degree. And it's, it's one concurrent year um, and it can kind of count towards one year um, towards your years as an EIT and engineer training for your um, provincial, I'm speaking in terms of, of Canadian things here, governing body that is a year toward as an EIT that can go towards getting your, your PNG. Um, I'm from Alberta, so I'm referring to a PEGA, but if you're from like BC, you have your governing body or Saskatchewan or the, the Maritimes or wherever you're from, it can count towards a year towards your professional designation, which is a big step up in your career. Um, at other universities, which I can't attest to quite as well, but I, I will do my best. They have a co-op program, and that's a bit more common, where you typically do four four-month work terms sort of scattered throughout your degree, um, whether it's in like the summers, like I've been doing May through August, or whether it's like a, you do it during like a winter semester, January through April or, or fall. Um, you kind of fill those four four-month work placements with, with time. And um, that's sort of how you accrue your 16 month work experience. So it works out to the same amount throughout your degree. Um, and um, sort of how you can get into that is often you'll apply to that through your school. Some schools have it mandatory. So you're already in it when you start your degree or sometimes you apply to it. Um, and many universities will have like a job board that will have placements that are directly targeted to students at your university to apply for. Um, so that's, that's, something, that's something, a resource that you'll have. And I would encourage you to check out if you're looking for that kind of thing. Um, I'm sure this is something that's been drilled into you or will be drilled into you if you're an aspiring or current engineering student. Um, but beyond those job boards, you can look on websites like LinkedIn. LinkedIn is so important. Please be active on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, LinkedIn. You can look on job job websites. Get LinkedIn ASAP, please. It is so important. And um, and it's just good to have that like professional presence online. Um, look look on job boards, and that's kind of where you can look for for roles. Um, and um, use your connections as well. Um, it's sometimes, unfortunately, we live in a world where it's not what you know, it's who you know. And if you have a connection, you know, your neighbor is um, a, a senior engineer at a company and he'd be willing to hook you up with a summer job. Um, you, um, sometimes you, if, it's, if it's family, it's family or, or just, you know, somebody, you know, like an old hockey or baseball coach. I know friends who have gotten jobs in companies from old coaches or, or mentors. Um, that's kind of how you can leverage yourself in a role. But if you don't have that, you're okay. A strong resume and cover letter and, you know, a really inspired and experienced individual can get themselves into these roles as well. Um, but I would encourage you to definitely use connections that you have because it's just a really important thing and network to build those connections. Job fairs are awesome. Make sure they know your name and, and make sure you, you come with lots of questions and, and come ready to sort of market yourself. Job searching and getting a job is all about selling yourself um, as a, as an asset essentially is what you are. So that's kind of my, my rundown on, on the general specifics of engineering co-op and internship. So did you have any like specific tips for students who maybe they found like a co-op that they're interested in and they want to apply to it? Like maybe guide you, guide everybody through your own experiences applying to like the engineering firm you've been working at for the uh, past two years? Yeah, so just for a tiny bit of background, I've been at the same sort of engineering firm for the last two summers. Um, they're an engineering consultant and they do electrical distribution design and work in the utilities industry. So it's, it's, it's very much related to my electrical engineering background. And I actually got that job by reaching out to somebody, um, I think by email. And I just came across their company and um, that's kind of how I heard about them. And, um, and I wanted mm -hmm. to learn more. Uh, at the time, I was just e finding an email randomly and it ended up being like CEO of the company it's a smaller firm. So it wasn't quite as like crazy as it sounds, but it worked out for me. Um, I asked him if they had like summer placements for students like me and, um, and yeah, um, sent my email to a manager up in Edmonton. Um, and I've been working for their office for the last two summers. Um, so 
sort of advice I would say is, is apply, make sure you have a polished resume that's been reviewed a million times by whether it be uh, career advisors at your universe, university, your peers, people who are sort of mentors in industry or whoever it is, have a good resume that highlights your skills, what you offer, um, and your experiences that are relevant to the job you're applying for. Make sure you tailor your resume every single time you send it. Same goes for a cover letter. Um, and that's how you're going to send it. Um, and I'd encourage you just to like network and connect with people while you apply. Like I think the success rate of just sending in your resume and cover letter is it's, it's, it's much less than 10% in terms of getting an interview. But when you have that kind of connection or you, you even set yourself up to get like an informative interview four months before you even look at applying for a job, that sort of connection can kind of vault you over the top. Um, and at least, at least at the very least can kind of get you in that, that interview room. And that comes from just getting yourself out there, throwing on a nice collared shirt when you're on a Zoom call at a, at a career fair and just talking to people. I did a whole lot of that in first year. I was, I was wearing this exact shirt. Um, and that's kind of how I recommend doing things. So highlight your skills, network with people and, and see what you like out there. And don't be afraid to just go for an opportunity that you don't think I mean, you're a little bit like, what is this? Like, just take that leap get a job and get some experiences and some skills that you can market yourself down the line as well. So that's kind of my advice is reach out to people, learn what you can, and then market yourself the absolute best you can. And persistence and resilience is key, but it's not easy. It's much like scholarships. No, I love that. Thanks for being able to share that with everybody. Cool. I know it's going to uh, help a lot of people. So uh, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So you're along the same lines, you're, uh, very passionate about en engineer, uh, energy and sustainable practices as a STEM student. So like, what do you think is down the road in terms of in, in that field? Like, what do you think might be the next big thing for that? Yeah. So climate change is like an, an undeniable fact that, that humans are going to have to, to deal with in the next century and years and even like next year and year after it's, it's, Maybe it's no sooner, longer yeah. a long-term issue. It's a regularly occurring issue. Um, um, at the time that this is being recorded, um, right now there's there's floods in Pakistan that have displaced 30 million people that are almost guaranteed to have been worsened by human-caused climate change. So this is a, a very present and real problem that has implications on like the well-being of humanity, but also in terms of money, this is gonna be a trillion dollar issue for many years to come. Um, and I guess that's that's a place where, where humanity, is, there's gonna be tons of opportunity to to engineer our way into a better and more sustainable and safe future for everyone. Um, so what I think is next is, is probably just, just inspired by just the news I was reading earlier today about 30 million people being displaced is we're gonna have to learn how to engineer and mitigate the effects of like floods um, and different things like that. So technology regarding flood mitigation, storm mitigation, wildfire mitigation, if that's more relevant to Canadians. If you're from the West or even out East now, there's, there's wildfires every year. Um, that kind of technology and how we're going to treat that on both a micro and local level and a macro level is going to keep developing. And that doesn't just, that's not just like forestry management. And that's not just like civil engineering when it comes to levees and, and things like that. It's, it's data analysis. It's how do we build infrastructure and create things such as electrical infrastructure, which is where I've been working the last two summers that is resistant to this. And, and, and means that we have resilience and, and, tried and tested infrastructure that can withstand the increased and worsening effects of climate change. Um, so that's sort of the first thing at the top of mind and, and kind of came to me earlier today when I was reading that news. But also um, technology such as carbon capture and storage um, mm -hmm. is going to become increasingly increasingly relevant. Um, if, I'm, if you're listening to this, uh, Canada's initiative that we are going to be net zero by 2050. And if you're not super aware of what that means, it means we have net zero carbon emissions. So if you do an analysis of of this, the country as a system as a whole. So you, you do a, a system analysis. We, we are carbon neutral, which means we don't emit more than we sort of um, absorb or abate essentially. So it doesn't mean we don't emit any carbon. It means that we don't add to the already existing amount in the atmosphere. And sort of technology around mitigating that um, will be a massive big thing in energy and sustainability. Um, technology that, um, is emissions free or low emissions, such as like how we get our electricity, electrifying our transportation, or using fuel sources such as hydrogen um, or sources such as wind and solar to power our society. 
I think is the next big thing. So it's a, it's an issue that is extremely multifaceted and will leave absolutely no industry or, or profession, I think, untouched at all. Even if you're in industry that seems under, unrelated, I promise you it's not. So, so yeah, that's kind of my very long-winded and, and inspired by recent events answer to what's, what's next in the, in the energy and sustainability Same world. Practice, yeah. No, it yeah. sounds very exciting. And I was also wanting to hear your thoughts about like electrical cars. Have you been following that and see where that, how that might play into the next few years? Cause I know that in a, like, I, I've read that in a few years, like m- most people, if not all uh, cars that people ride are going to be electric in, in the future. But then again, there are uh, some issues associated with uh, driving electrical cars because how are you getting that energy? It's from non-renewable sources. So like, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so electric cars are, are sort of what's always in the news, right? Like you're, you're mm-hmm. hearing about Tesla and um, Elon Musk is, is never not in the, in the news, right? So Tesla and the electric EV industries as a whole is a big deal. Like there's massive government uh, funding and subsidies of that in the US and Canada. Um, and we are, and most major car manufacturers are stopping the production of gasoline burning vehicles in the 2030s. Um, so yeah, I've been following electric cars a decent amount, but um, disclaimer, I'm definitely not an expert and um, I'll make sure I try not to say anything that's that's super uh, opinion based or, or anything too crazy here. Um, I just turned on the light so you guys can see me a little better. Um, so yeah, that issue is, is a multifaceted one, but something that I think a lot of people say, and I'm from Alberta, so if you're not aware of how we get our electricity, um, the, to the best of my knowledge, we get our about 50 to 60% of our electrical energy is from coal, which is not carbon neutral, like it's quite carbon intensive. Um, so it's like, what's the point in uh, reducing the emissions of a car when you burn gasoline when you have coal? Um, so that's definitely a valid issue and it requires a very systems level analysis. Um, we are on the way of phasing out coal and, and moving to things such as even natural gas um, and uh, renewables such as uh, hydro, wind, and solar that will make charging your car in the future um, a much less carbon intensive process. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is something to consider now. Um, um, Elon Musk, his sort of argument for that is he's been asked the same question, right? I mean, he's the, the face of the EV industry, whether it's a good thing or not. Um, um, something that's good about at least um, burning the fossil fuels um, at the power plants that you're at, instead of from your engine is it's much more localized and it's much more, it's easier to do things such as uh, air capture and carbon capture and storage at the source mm-hmm. rather than trying to stop it at a, in a combustion engine. Um, mm-hmm. And something that um, in terms of efficiency, and I'm, I'm getting very technical here, so I'll try to steer away, but it's much more efficient to burn things on a high scale. Like we're m- much more in the range of 40 to 60% efficiency for, for fossil fuels, especially with natural gas. Um, whereas cars, uh, like your combustion engines, like more like 20%. So it's, it's still more efficient to burn and less carbon intensive overall, mm-hmm. but that sort of changed cars, but also changing things on a whole systems level. So um, if you're interested in like energy and then the environment engineering, it's all about taking a systems level analysis and approach to issues. It's much more than just changing your car from a, a gasoline car to a battery powered car. Um, and, um, and yeah, that's sort of, that's sort of my opinion on it right now. Um, okay. and in terms of issues with it, like, I think, um, something that else I think is interesting is our electrical grid. And again, I work in this industry, so you're getting, you're getting the engineer in me coming out. So, so bear with me, but our grid wasn't built to handle all that charging. So how we adapt our infrastructure is going to be very key in the next 10 years. Um, when we, when our electrical demand is growing by one to 3% a year across Canada, um, and that is a huge growth that involves lots of building infrastructures. So mm-hmm. um, it's much more simple than just buying a Tesla. So that's what I would encourage people to realize. And and it's not just that. So it's always important to do, just think a little deeper whenever you're thinking about the choices you make. And, you know, it's not just paper straws, you know? So there's my very engineering and technical heavy answer, but I hope that sort of sheds some light. Yeah, no, it was really interesting to hear about that. So uh, yeah, thank you for the knowledge. I'm very knowledge hungry. So always Love always it. happy to yeah get more in but yeah cool when you're when you're not busy with school helping others saving saving the world from an energy crisis what like what do you like to do what do you like to do in your spare time 
Um, in my spare time, I just love spending time with my friends. Uh, love, love trying new foods. I've been spending my summer in the last few months just eating new foods. It's, it's been awesome. Indian food. I'm You've tried a lot of Indian food. Uh, I have tried a lot from of what Indian I've heard. food. I, I, have, yeah. I have. I've had a lot of Indian food and I've just been, I've been really fortunate. I've been, I've been enjoying it very much. So um, yeah, like I, I just, I love it so much. Just uh, like some good non roti, you know. Some oh, anything, yes. Yes. Anything <laughs> from here. Oh, I just love it, man. Uh, there's much more than that, but those are the ones that come to mind. I, I just love it. Um, okay. So trying food is, is something I love to do. Um, I love to try food from all places and I'll try anything once. I love to explore the city I'm in. I think it's really important to be a tourist in your own city. Um, I've been exploring parts of Calgary. I'm from the, the south and I'm in the suburbs. So I love going downtown and seeing the Peace Bridge and the Bow River and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I love to do it with my friends and, and spending time that way. Um, and uh, I like to, to, I try to stay active. Um, you know, sit, uh, I, I work from home, so I'm sitting all day. So I try to go around and I love playing basketball. I've shot hoops and played basketball most of my life. And we, we played basketball together. Game. That was really fun. Yeah. We should do that again. We have, we should definitely play basketball together, Shub. It'd be totally Always down. fun. And I've been taking up golf recently as well, which um, mm. has been super fun. And it's it's a challenge. Golf is not an easy sport, but it's been super good. So yeah, Shub, I think, I think I don't know if you've talked about this on your on your podcast before, but I think um, your your listeners would be interested. What does Shub Patel do for fun when he's not uh, doing cardiac research, when he's not you know, <laughs> being a STEM fellow member, or when he's not helping with TDS or being a rotor actor or... Guys, Shub does everything, just, just to guys give you a, a disclaimer. But what do you do for fun when you pick up your feet at the end of a very long day? I love talking to people. I love talking to my friends, hanging out with them. Uh, basketball is a huge thing. I love sporting. Uh, Cole, as I said, Cole and I have already played basketball before, but that's what I've been keeping busy with when I'm, I guess, not studying or uh, working on some oddball projects. I've also taken up running. I, I've been running throughout my life, but I got more into it when the pen, pandemic hit. And I actually ran my first ever marathon last summer. And I wanted to do an ultra marathon, but things didn't work out this summer. But hopefully I'll aim for next uh, next summer. But that's, that's also been keeping me busy, uh, basketball running. I, I love creating and watching content um, like I'm doing right now. I'm an avid podcaster and YouTuber. You should all follow my YouTube channel, Shoot Patel. Uh, if you're not already subscribed, go subscribe right now. I create a lot of vlog content and I want to get into more like educational type uh, on there as well because uh, that's helped me a ton and I want to, I guess, give back in that way. And similar to you, Cole, I love devouring food, uh, trying different types and kinds of food uh, all around, different cuisines. Uh, Indian food is probably my favorite, but uh, there's also many others that I have been and love trying. So yeah, those are some of the other things that keep me busy, Cole. Awesome. Uh, I see we have a lot of similarities. <laughs> we do, man. We love food and we, we like to play basketball. So it means it means yeah. you got to go play some basketball and enjoy some Indian food after. How about that? I love that. Um, Let's do that after we wrap this up. <laughs> <laughs> even though it's 9 a.m almost 9 yeah, p.m and, uh, yeah it is it is getting late so but yeah, yeah. i think um that's super exciting and, and having fun is important guys it's not all business it's live your life have fun that's right with the people you care about. It's, it's, it's try to have a balance balance yeah. is a huge thing i talked about this in one of my previous episodes as well uh balance is good but cool uh wrapping this up any final words of wisdom advice or would you like to share like helpful resources that have uh got you to where you are today and you'd like to leave the listeners with um i think in terms of resources i think what i'd say is um there's tons of great resources out there on youtube ali abdal is someone that i've listened to upon the recommendation of shoe um there's tons of great books out there um um huge like self-help podcast or book guy um, I, I typically, when I entertain myself with books and stuff, I just, I just like to sometimes just chill and, and not think about, you know, I just like to like, sometimes just like to laugh and listen to some comedy. <laughs> um, but so I would say like, look out and find somebody who inspires you and never take advice from somebody who you don't want to emulate in some way. And don't take criticism from somebody you don't want to take advice from. So that's what I'd say. Like everyone's given their opinions out there in the, on the internet. And this is my first podcast. So I guess now I'm guilty of that as well. So listen to people who you want to emulate in some way and, um, and yeah, just, just take their advice um, as it is and, and do with it what you will. Um, and I think my final, my final words would be is, is um, you know, work hard, 
Um, take care of yourself, you know, be good to one another, be good to your family and your friends. Um, and I think it'll get you a lot of good places, you know, putting in your best effort every day and, and striving to just be a tiny bit, that 1% better every single day makes all the world of a difference. And I think that's the best that most of us can do. And, and it's, it's really exciting. So, so yeah, I think that's the words I'd, uh, I'd leave with and, um, and yeah, just, you can all, be kind to one another, be kind to yourself, work hard and, and, uh, never, never be afraid to chase your dreams or, or take a leap because it will always pay dividends. Cole, it was truly a pleasure to have you today. Uh, really appreciate you being able to share your diverse and array of experiences from, uh, winning Schulich, uh, your experiences as an engineering student at the University of Calgary, uh, your high school experiences, your experiences with co-op and just every, everything in and around that. I uh, appreciate, you, appreciate you being on the show today. Uh, uh, best wishes with everything going forward. And um, let's go out to play some basketball and eat some food soon. Let's do it. it was a pleasure to be on the STEM Fellows podcast. And, um, and yeah, I can't thank you enough for taking your time to chat with me today. And um, yeah, thanks so much. And I know we'll chat soon. And yeah, thanks everyone for listening. That's all for this month. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you like this episode, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, if you have questions or thoughts about this episode or just want to connect, I'd love to get an email from you at the email address that's listed in the show notes. Uh, thank you again for listening and I'll see you next time.